Tonight, the winds and heat are up, the fires are growing closer, and the stories of escape are gripping. It was all coming towards us, and the sky was dark. I had blinkers on, we had a truck full. Kids are all in the back. The pictures make it plain to see Alberta is far from out of the woods. A new review recommends the first line treatment for women in menopausal transition, hormone therapy. I think, like me, most women are confused. Home renovations gone wrong. Why owners want answers from Canada's biggest bank. Why would they promote people that aren't good at what, you know, what they're doing? This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. When wildfires become more than just individual threats, when the walls of fire and the seas of smoke expand and merge, an entire region is in a kind of chokehold, like Alberta tonight. As the danger spreads for firefighters and evacuees alike, options are narrowing. The vast majority of the province remains awash in red, extreme fire risk. Of the 90 wildfires burning in Alberta, about two dozen are out of control. There are 15 mandatory evacuation orders. More than 17,000 people currently forced from their homes and some will not have homes to go back to. Katie Nicholson is in the community of high level Alberta where people are also running out of places to find refuge. As hot wind fed the ravenous Long Lake fire and pushed it over the road, the sky over Chate in northwestern Alberta turned crimson and orange, and a mass of black smoke blew in. It was all coming towards yeah. us, and the sky was dark. Yeah. Um, they were watering the roads, but the smoke was really thick. I had blinkers on. We had a truck full. Yeah. Kids are all in the back, us in the front, everything in the back and we left. The ashes were falling. It was really windy. More than 750 from the small Denny community forced to evacuate to the town they always turn to in flood and fire, high level. There's just one problem. There is a lot of people in high level. The hotels are already packed with evacuees from another fire in the east. The town has 250 cots in its arena, good for a night or two, but not for the long haul. Some are sleeping in tents, the chief is barely sleeping at all. I couldn't fall asleep right away because I was really concerned about Chate. Like there's infrastructures there. Um, what is going to become of it if the fire ever gets into the community? What does that mean for our people? Closer to the heart of the fire, where electric poles and cell towers have burned down. Like I said, there's no cell service for anything. More than 200 are holding the line in Rainbow Lake like Jeff Chonkley, working night shifts to bulldoze fire guards in the dense, dry woods. I hope it's, it gets contained. They're doing a good job out there, like the ground crews are doing an excellent job. But as the winds whip up and the lodgings dry up, some are opting to leave the north, at least for now. I have two daughters that live off reserve, so I'm going to go stop in Grand Prairie first, visit shortly with one, and then go stay at the other ones with my two little grandchildren here. A long drive past dozens more fires and a growing network of evacuations. So Katie, what happened? Did she make it out of high level okay? Yeah, she texted me today. She did, but she was nervous the entire journey that she was going to get stuck. Here's the thing. There's only so many routes out of the north, and they're increasingly becoming choked by new fires and new evacuation orders. Uh, so it's not just beds that the people are running out of. It's, it's roads. I'll give you an example. Uh, some of the evacuees here last night were hoping to go to Hay River. Well, obviously, that's out of the question. That community now in its own fire battle with its own evacuation orders. I spoke to uh, a fire suppression expert with more than 30 years in the business today. He said the conditions up here in northern Alberta, he's never seen them more dangerous or more volatile. Wow. All right. Katie Nicholson in high level Alberta. Thank you, Katie. Now, the wildfire threat isn't confined to Alberta. As you heard, the Northwest Territories communities of Hay River and the nearby First Nation of Catlodice are both under evacuation orders. The fire jumped the river, and Catlodice was the first in its path. 
The latest report is 15 structures on the First Nation have been damaged. Both communities on the Hay River, just south of Great Slave Lake, were badly damaged by floods last year. And B.C. is also suffering tonight more than 50 wildfires burning in the province. The latest evacuation of Blueberry First Nation affecting 500 people and the 20,000 people of nearby Fort St. John have been told to prepare to evacuate if things get worse. Clearly, a lot of what happens next depends on the weather. So let's bring in CBC meteorologist Christy Kleimenhaga. So Christy, uh, talking to Katie, there is a lot of smoke in high level, not so much there in Edmonton, but I understand that could be changing. Yeah, we are seeing a change or expecting a change through much of Alberta as we do see a big shift in our winds tonight and into the day tomorrow. We have been seeing this southeasterly direction in our winds so far, and that's going to be shifting coming out of the northwest and strengthening a little bit tomorrow as you move through the day. So what that means is all of that smoke that's been stuck into northern Alberta will start to make its way down into areas like Edmonton, potentially even further south and and start to potentially affect our air quality here. So we will likely see a change in the sky line as you make your way into the day tomorrow. So a change, yes, but, but something you didn't say there is that there's any, uh, you know, relief coming in the forecast. Yeah, I mean, when you get these frontal systems that we're expecting tonight, a cold front sw swinging through, not really a great situation for fire uh, fires in the province because they do bring with them switches and wind and very strong gusts and not a lot of rain in sight with this one either. So this week, a couple of cooler days, maybe some showers in the Northwest Territories to bring some relief there, but back towards the 30s by the end of the week. So another hot, dry stretch ahead for most of the region. And then the best chance for some actual relief coming by the end of the weekend. So a long way to wait and uh, quite a long range forecast there to deal with too, Adrian. Yeah, a long way indeed. All right, Christy Kleimenhagen, Edmonton, thank you. Now the Prime Minister was in Edmonton to meet with military personnel supporting the firefighting effort. You're freeing up the professionals for being where they are most... Uh, That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And if we can come with 100 soldiers, that might free up 50 firefighters to go deal with the challenging situation that we couldn't deal with. Yeah. 300 Canadian Forces personnel have been deployed across the province to back up the professional fire groups. Federal government ambitions in the auto sector are getting a bit of a scare. Car maker Stellantis has stopped construction of an Ontario electric vehicle battery plant. As Tom Stegler shows us, money is the issue and jobs are at stake. Just as Canada's auto sector seemed to be cruising, a bump in the road has some workers fearing trouble ahead. Well, that would be an economic disaster for this region. It could go up in smoke. Across town from the Windsor assembly plant churning out Chryslers, parent company Stellantis has paused much of the work to build a new electric vehicle battery plant. The multinational telling CBC News the Canadian government has not delivered on what was agreed to, so all construction related to the battery module production on the Windsor site has stopped. My stomach fell a little bit. Uh, this is a pretty serious move uh, by Stellantis. The new plant is supposed to generate 2,500 jobs, with Ottawa and Ontario kick-starting the project last year by together contributing a billion dollars. So yes, we put up a lot of money. But the federal government recently pledged up to a whopping $13 billion in a separate mega deal with Volkswagen. We need the uh, federal government to step up, uh, as they did for Volkswagen. All this Prime Minister does is wrap our industry in red tape, weigh them down in taxes. The city has seen expected jobs vanish before. 20 years ago, Chrysler dropped plans to assemble this small pickup in Windsor. We want to see the federal government follow through on commitments, get this plant built to make sure those jobs are there for Windsor. Now Ottawa is under added pressure with Washington offering major subsidies to EV battery makers. All of it leading the finance minister to stress Canada's means aren't unlimited. And we are counting on Ontario to do its fair share and we're counting on Stellantis to be reasonable. The federal government says it's still negotiating with Stellantis. Neither side is saying how much additional money is needed to keep the Windsor project alive. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. General Motors has recalled 42,000 SUVs in Canada over defective airbags. 
So GM says the driver's airbag in its 2014 to 2017 models may explode when deployed. Nearly one million vehicles were also recalled in the U.S. on Friday for the same reason. Canadian home prices are on the rise. Last month, the national average for a resale home was a little over $700,000. That's up more than $100,000 since the start of the year, though still down from the highs of early last year. Sales have been picking up, but they're still almost 20% lower than last year. The number of homes listed for sale is at a 20-year low. Now, for Canadians who rent their homes, there is no relief in sight. New numbers show the average cost of a two-bedroom unit was over $2,200 a month in April. As Allison Northcott tells us, many renters are feeling the squeeze. When Fiona Scott's landlord told her he was evicting her after seven years so he could renovate... Oh, gutted. Absolutely gutted. Because you have an emotional connection to your house. She eventually found a new apartment that's more expensive. Four, four, five hundred dollars more. Um, I'm doing some work, extra work, so that I can afford that. According to new data, average rents across Canada are up nearly 10 percent since last year. In Vancouver, the average rent for a two-bedroom jumped by 17 percent to more than $3,700 a month. The highest percentage increase was in Brampton, Ontario, where rents jumped nearly 27 percent year over year to $2,400. To add interest rates increasing, you, you add uh, immigration increasing, and then also inflation. And so that just caused the perfect storm. Rents are also climbing in Montreal. Politicians, landlords and housing advocates have been meeting to look at how to fix the problem. What is it that is left after you've paid for housing to feed yourself, to clothe yourself and to transport yourself? And the amount is staggering. So we're talking about 360,000 households that are affected right now, that are in the negative starting the month. Landlords say the rental pressure comes from a lack of new construction and inventory. But outside the meeting, advocates demanded more social housing. What we are hearing behind me right now is one of the part of the solution is to take the streets one housing group created a new rental registry. It tracks and publishes rent increases to try to prevent steep hikes. It's urging governments to use it. Making this information available to everyone ensures that a fair price is paid from the get-go. He says it could be part of the solution to keep rental prices from going up even more. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Some homeowners are speaking out about a home renovation service owned by RBC. It's called Smart Reno. But some people who used it say it wasn't a smart move after all. Angelina King explains. This is supposed to be the fabulous retreat. Instead, Sandy Klein says she and her husband were left with an unfinished renovation. And the work that was done was shoddy, she says. A shower that sprays brown water. They're all kind of falling apart. A broken custom bed frame. A closet with nowhere to hang clothes. He had no clue what he was doing. According to an independent inspection report, windows, plumbing and a deck were all installed incorrectly. The clients say they spent about $70,000 on the job and estimate it'll cost another $30,000 to fix. They want RBC to foot the bill since the bank owns Smart Reno and the client signed up for it after the bank sent an email promoting it. And the whole program was about trusting the bank to send us somebody uh, trustworthy, licensed, insured, and and capable. Smart Reno's website says its trusted contractors have been verified for insurance, past lawsuits, and licensing. Online reviews show others have had positive experiences, but the Vanderleests did not. Blondie, come here. When Christina and Justin Vanderlees needed a contractor after buying a fixer-upper farmhouse, their RBC mortgage specialist recommended Smart Reno. These were supposedly vetted professionals. But they say they were left with cracking and bubbling drywall, a shifting bathtub, cracking tiles and a leak in the ceiling from a newly installed toilet. It just started kind of coming through the ceiling so I had to put down buckets. The Vanderlees want a more transparent and robust vetting process for future customers. Why would they promote people that aren't good at what you know what they're doing? 
RBC says it takes concerns seriously, but it doesn't accept any liability for contractors, saying the renovation agreement is between the contractor and homeowner. As for the two contractors in question, RBC says they're no longer part of the Smart Reno program. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Just weeks after the announcement of a major restructuring, Vice Media has filed for bankruptcy protection in the U.S. The company says a consortium of lenders has agreed to buy parts of it for $225 million. That deal, expected to be completed within two to three months, reportedly doesn't include Vice TV or other international entities. Opposition parties in Thailand are forming an alliance tonight after a monumental election win. It could mark a seismic shift in the political landscape away from military rule. As our South Asia correspondent Slima Shivji shows us, that's why some fear what might come next. A victory parade through the streets of Bangkok after a stunning win. Pro-democracy parties dominated Sunday's election, with voters overwhelmingly choosing both the progressive left-wing Move Forward and the more established opposition party Putai. Together, they demolished the incumbent, a former army chief who led the last coup, a stinging loss for the ruling military elite. It's an irrefutable sign that Thai voters are desperate for change. The democratic uh, parties will change a lot of, like, you know, the structures of Thai politics. I think it's coming from there, the younger generation first, but then the entire society has adopted the idea. Ideas for change that were once unthinkable in Thai society, curbing the sweeping power of the military and the monarchy, even reforming a law that imposes stiff penalties for insulting the king. People have been through enough of last decade, in the past decade, and today is a new day. Move Forward's leader has already negotiated a coalition with the other opposition parties. I am ready to be the prime minister for all, whether you agree with me or you disagree with me. But plenty in the pro-military establishment do disagree with him, and the system is stacked against the opposition parties. The Senate, loaded with military appointees, can vote on who becomes prime minister and block whomever they wish. I think military coup would be the, really the, the, the last resort. Still, this expert says the junta could try to manipulate the results. A move that would be a direct affront to the will of voters like this 29-year-old. The results show that everyone's small voice can still change the country, he says, after an election that saw a 75% voter turnout, the highest ever. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. Voter turnout was also high in Turkey, about 90%, but the results were also so incredibly close, the voters are going to have to do it again. <laughs> Incumbent President Recep Tayyip Erdogan came up just short of more than 50% of votes needed to avoid a runoff. He will now go head-to-head -head against his rival, Kemal Kilic Darulu, in two weeks' time. To Ukraine now and reports tonight of several blasts around Kiev, though no immediate information on what may have been hit or hurt. It comes as the country's president heads home after a whirlwind trip through Europe. Volodymyr Zelensky is armed with more weapons and promises of more support. But as Chris Brown explains, he didn't get everything he wanted. Ukraine's Vladimir Zelensky helicoptered into Britain with yet another shopping list of weapons for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Britain has already anteed up over $8 billion worth of military hardware. Crucially, early on, the UK paved the way for Ukraine to receive powerful offensive systems, including storm shadow cruise missiles. Now Zelensky wants modern fighter jets. We want to create this uh, jets coalition. And I'm very positive with it. Sunak's response was, not yet. But he did offer to train Ukrainian pilots and send more long-range drones and said the British weapons will keep coming. We are here for the long term. We remain steadfast in wanting to defend Ukraine. Zelensky's trip here and his hopscotching across Europe meeting other leaders comes as the tempo on the battlefield picks up. 
Ukraine is having modest success at pushing Russian forces back around the hellish landscape of Bakhmut, creating internal fights for Russia. A report in the Washington Post claims Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner mercenaries who've been trying to take Bakhmut, offered to reveal the positions of Russian soldiers to the Ukrainians. Prigozhin has openly fumed about a lack of ammunition from Moscow. And Russia is struggling in other ways. There was an attack on a senior occupying official in Luhansk, one of several in the last few days, and reports of four Russian aircraft shot down. Russian propagandists have sound especially incensed with Britain of late, vowing retaliation. TV host Dmitry Kisilov warned Britain is just a small, vulnerable island and it had better watch out. After leaving London, Zelensky posted a video from a train saying he's heading home with Ukraine stronger than when he left. Now everyone is watching to see how all of those new weapons will be used in a looming Ukrainian offensive. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. A new medical literature review has an emphatic conclusion on a first-line treatment for women in menopausal transition. There's a lot of clinicians just don't feel comfortable with hormone therapy. Why researchers say the risks of hormone therapy are now better known. Next. Plus, a dramatic encounter on the open walk. Oh, the fisherman, his kayak, and the hungry shark. And a little later, oh, Canada, this is not the streak we wanted. I just know, God, it's frustrating. The Stanley Cup drought that's now hit 30 years. We're back in two. Okay, well, that's terrible. This is a scene clearly maybe a little too close to Jaws-like reality. This tiger shark attacked that man's kayak as he was fishing. He managed to kick the shark away, incredibly. Says people probably wouldn't have believed him if he hadn't caught it all on camera. Now, for years, women in menopause were discouraged from using hormone therapy for their symptoms. The concern, a risk of stroke or breast cancer. But now, a review of the research shows why those fears might have been overblown. Christine Birat breaks it down. Well, I think, like me, most women are confused. Janet Coe says she was blindsided by menopause. Insomnia, night sweats, brain fog. Then, she ended up in an emergency room. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Coe saw doctors, but says she didn't get much advice. Researchers say that's not unusual. We've identified a real gap in care for menopausal symptoms. A newly published Canadian review examining the management of menopause notes, it is critical that doctors discuss symptoms and treatment options with their patients, including hormone therapy. Given the history of hormone therapy and the studies and, and the whole evolution, there's a lot of clinicians just don't feel comfortable with hormone therapy, don't feel comfortable prescribing it. Breathe. A 2002 study found hormone therapy carried higher risks, but more recent studies have shown it can offer real benefits for younger women. The latest guidelines state for healthy menopausal women under 60 experiencing hot flashes and night sweats, the benefits of menopausal hormone therapy typically outweigh the risks. If taken for less than five years, the risk of breast cancer is less than one in 1,000 women. When you are doing your Google searches and you're trying to be able to help yourself uh, figure out how to manage your symptoms or trying to understand what your body is going through, that you want to be able to use credible resources. The Canadian Menopause Society recommends this site, mq6.ca, which offers patients and doctors questions to start the conversation around symptoms and treatment. Experts warn hormone therapy shouldn't be taboo, but it's no cure-all either. If someone's telling you only positive things or someone's telling you only negative things, that, that you should probably get another opinion. Women deserve to understand that they don't have to suffer through symptoms that can last for a decade or more. Co says hormone therapy may not be for everyone, but for her, it worked. Christine Birak, CBC News, Port Credit, Ontario. Princess Anne will be making a visit to New Brunswick later this week. When we sat down ahead of her brother's coronation, we spoke at length about her many visits to Canada, including one that's a bit of a fog for her. 
Do you remember much of it? I don't I barely remember starting. I certainly don't remember finishing. Her dramatic Thank Olympic you, performance and her deep connection with this country. More of my exclusive interview next. Defending against a growing threat from North Korea. We fought and died for this. We're staying here. Sasha Petrusek is in South Korea speaking with the Canadian soldiers training for an attack. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Well, after marking the coronation of a new king, Canadians are about to get a visit from a very familiar princess. Anne arrives later this week, another link in her long connection with this country, something she and I talked about during our exclusive interview. A swing through the CBC's archives unearths a treasure trove of royal footage. So many trips over the decades. And it appears that so much effort went into making those trips feel informal. Have a look at this Yellowknife barbecue in 1970. The thick crowds to just watch her eat a hamburger. I get the opportunity to meet many Canadians and that is what has been such a pleasure. Uh, my links to this land and its people run deep. Princess Anne appears seemingly everywhere in the north, in big cities, and most notably as an Olympian at the Montreal Olympics in 1976. Princess Anne this afternoon at the equestrian events, and the goal is Anne's ambition. Every athlete that I've ever spoken with at the Olympics always says that for all the training they do, for everything they know that's about to happen, the Olympics experience changes them. That's probably true, um, but it's a different competition because so often with your own national championships or anything else, you're in and out. Mm -hmm. you, you come in, you do your competition and you leave. You go to the Olympics, there's more time on your hands and it's quite a different discipline for some people. And not all of them cope with their training regime in the same way uh, when they've got that kind of time available. So yeah, it does change you a bit because you you have to be able to adapt to be able to um, cope, I think. Rain overnight in Montreal, very slippery out there. There it is, that's the fall. Your injury or your fall in, in Montreal, do you, do you remember much of it? I no. Mean, you really don't? No, I don't, I don't rem I barely remember starting. I certainly don't remember finishing, so, um, and I don't remember the fall. And have, oddly enough, until I saw the video afterwards, that was, which was really quite interesting. It must have been very strange to see it not having remembered it. It was quite strange. Um, I think the horse did a very good job in staying upright um, because he, although he fell, he didn't roll over, which would have been much more painful. But there was a fence after I got back on again where he put his foot down between mm. um, the takeoff and the, and the fence itself. And I thought that could have been much nastier. But no, I don't remember. But she's a plucky one and she's back up again. That memory may not exist, but there are other trips to draw from. Decades of handshakes and cookouts and endless photographs. And soon she'll be back for her first trip to Canada since COVID hit. A short one to honour a long connection with the 8th Canadian Hussars. She became their Colonel in Chief in 1972, has stood by them ever since, and she'll be back in New Brunswick for their 175th anniversary this month. And aside from, from this anniversary, why this trip? Why right now? Well, why this trip is it's its 175th anniversary, which is no mean achievement. And although it isn't a regular regiment anymore, all of that history is still there. And it reflects an awful lot of the local community. And it's still important that they support it as well, mm -hmm. because that is a skill set, um, a service ethos, which you really don't want to lose very, you know, it's always going to be needed. Is there any time in the schedule for anything approximating rest? Not on this one, no. <laughs> Not on this one. Um, and my, actually, I have grandchildren who go to New Brunswick on holidays. They know the beaches because um, they, they're really good beaches. But no, it's, it, this time of year is too difficult, really. Your Highness, thank you so much come for on. your time. Oh, well, Genuinely come appreciate along, it.
can watch our full interview with Princess Anne anytime on CBC Gem and the Nationals YouTube channel or stream it on CBC News Explore. Now, North Korea's growing arsenal of nuclear weapons and its ongoing missile tests have ramped up tensions in a region used to being on edge. Things are already are tense and they could escalate even more. How some Canadians are getting ready to defend South Korea against attack. That's coming up next. The blast of propaganda, North Korea tested what it says is a solid fuel intercontinental ballistic missile with enough range to deliver a nuclear warhead to the continental U.S. So with COVID, climate concerns, a major war in Ukraine, it might be easy to miss North Korea's constant missile tests, but not in Seoul. For South Korea, each launch casts a bit of a long shadow. Sasha Petrosek went there to witness a country girding itself for war, possibly nuclear, one it would be fighting with Canada at its side. Little Gibraltar had the Canadian 25th Infantry Brigade involved. Step into a corner of South Korea like these Canadians have and feel their determination to defend this country all over again. We fought and died for this, we're staying here. Mm. So they end Despite a threat from the north that seems greater than ever, nuclear war. And that's very clear. I mean, if something occurs that disrupts or destroys that peace and security here, Canada has signed the support and help. So potentially we'd be fighting on the side of South Korea? Potentially, yeah. I mean, the coalition is, is made for that. A coalition formed seven decades ago to fight a Korean war that's never officially ended. A UN force led by the US to push back a North Korean invasion. 26,000 Canadians fought, more than 500 died here. There were multiple Canadian yeah, yeah, yeah. battalions, well, RCR and Van Dues. I I think uh, nine Canadian troops are with that UN force still amid rising tensions. Since the start of last year, North Korea has fired more than 100 test missiles. Its leader, Kim Jong-un, demonstrating his nuclear capability, a national preoccupation that years of tough sanctions and global pressure couldn't stop. With every advance in nu nuclear missiles by North Korea, its reach gets farther, the stakes get higher, and down here at bases in the south, the time to react gets that much shorter. Military planners are constantly finding themselves calculating, recalculating, and training. Not far from the border, U.S. troops drill. Rescuing and treating injured soldiers under fire. Setting their sights on an enemy who could come over the hills at any time. Yes, we're in an environment where things are already are tense and they could escalate even more. For seven decades, this has been sufficient. The presence of more than 28,000 U.S. troops, plus American air power and the comfort of Washington's distant nuclear umbrella. U.S. President Joe Biden underlined his commitment while meeting with South Korean President Yoon suk yeol last month. Our mutual defense treaty is ironclad. That includes the nuclear threat and the nuclear deterrent. Korean support for U.S. forces has been strong, but for many now, that's not enough. Seven out of ten here tell pollsters they feel vulnerable without nuclear weapons permanently on South Korean soil preferably their own. South Korea, we are nuclear hostage. Cheon seong woon is a former secretary for security strategy to the South Korean president. His message to the foreign force protecting the South? You are conventional organization. 
Now, unfortunately, Korea enters the nuclear age. You have to adapt yourself to become a nuclear-oriented organization. Are you ready? Many aren't sure the world community is ready to tackle North Korea at all. Kim Byung-uk among them. He defected from the North 21 years ago. Sanctions and military pressure have failed. Isolating North Korea has been a disaster. We need to accept them as part of the world community and open real dialogue. He says Kim Jong-un's obsession with acquiring nuclear weapons is partly out of feeling threatened, especially by U.S. forces on his doorstep. Now it's the South feeling threatened and considering much the same buildup, and Canadians quite possibly in the middle. So as you heard in Sasha's story there, the policy of isolating Pyongyang isn't working, at least as far as its missile program is concerned. With supposedly tough sanctions in place, how is North Korea getting all the technology and know-how to pose a threat? How concerned should the world be? For some insight, we turn to Robert Huish, an expert on human rights and security on the Korean Peninsula. I guess that the first, maybe the most important question, Robert, is, is how real is the threat that North Korea poses and who's at risk? Yeah, it, it's it's very real. Anytime that we're dealing with the potential for a nuclear explosion, uh, be it a test within North Korea or towards its neighbors, there, there's there's a serious risk involved with this. So we're seeing North Korea there in the yellow. Uh, that's uh, that's our focus. But then who is a potential target of nuclear aggression from North Korea? Well, South Korea, Japan in particular, because they do have the missile technology and capability to reach those two targets. Mm -hmm. There's also the concern for, for Canada and for the United States, especially the Pacific Northwest, to potentially receive a uh, missile, missile attack from North Korea, providing they have all the right equipment. Okay. So what I, what I don't understand as a layperson is how is North Korea importing these weapon systems with all these sanctions in place? When you look at this map here, you see who in the red are North Korea's cozied up trading partners, right? A lot of trade comes from, from China and, uh, and Russia who border North Korea. But when it comes to nuclear proliferation, there's a few key elements at stake here. One is the technology itself. A lot of the technology they have in North Korea has come directly from Pakistan. The next thing you need is fuel. And there's been a long record of Indian shipping companies sending fuel into North Korea uh, despite sanctions. But but how do they how do they actually get through without being spotted? So this is a this is a vessel here that in 2016 was actually in Vancouver Harbor and it said that it was on its way from Vancouver to Pakistan to deliver whatever it was carrying at the time. This is what the automated identification tracking system on the ship reported its actual path that it went from Vancouver, but then it stopped outside of North Korea for a period of two days, essentially loitering and then carried on to Pakistan. So what that ship was doing was broadcasting a false automated identification system message. So that was a simple way of doing it, just simply uh, fudging the, log, the logbooks. The thing with, with North Korea's shipping and with their networks more broadly is that they're able to be more deceptive today than they were in 2017, 2016. Uh, the ability to spoof the identities of other ships, that's a big player. They've also got the ability to send uh, financial transactions through WeChat and other and other electronic sources that's harder to, to pick up. And another thing is that now it's even easier to change the registration and the management and even the ownership of a vessel, even while it's at sea. So all of this has become a lot easier and North Korea is able to, to pursue that. Hmm. When you talk about Canada's support, what does that actually look like? Well, in the past, Canada has provided some intelligence collection uh, to to North Korea's um, to North Korean waters uh, alongside American and French vessels who are trying to monitor this this traffic to see whether or not proliferation material was going in and out or other illicit substances. But uh, besides submarines being put in place here, 
Um, there could be a role for Canada to work a bit more regionally. Um, I think our strength could really be trying to, to work with other countries in the Pacific region to say, look, there is a proliferation threat, there is a security threat here. And even though smaller Pacific Island nations might, might seem small and hard to find on maps, they play a really important role in one, protecting their own waters, uh, giving access to, to governments who may be doing disingenuous activities and also flagging these vessels. These are, these are the three key ingredients that make this a lot more riskier than, uh, than it would be if, if those countries were not participating in that network. Makes it a lucrative neighborhood, eh? Very much so. And a really important uh, geostrategic chess piece that's now coming into play. Hmm. All right, Robert, thank you. Always terrifying to talk to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, with playoff losses over the weekend, there are no longer any Canadian teams in the running for the Stanley Cup. The Stanley Cup drought now decades long. That's coming up. Plus. He just kept coming closer and closer and was definitely interested. A drone in BC gets up close and personal with a majestic bird of prey. It looks a little frightening in our moment. I'm Alex Panetta, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, what's happening to asylum seekers who traveled months or years to get to Quebec's Roxham Road, only to find it effectively closed? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, with Edmonton losing to Vegas last night, Canada's three Stanley Cup contenders are out. New playoff season, same playoff result. A drought measured in decades. Travis Danraj takes a look at the championship futility. They were not supposed to be one of the favorites. 30 years, 30 long years. In Montreal, the Canadians win the Stanley Cup. June 9th, 1993, that was the last time a Canadian team hoisted the cup. The Habs victorious that night in history. Over the weekend, dreams were dashed for both the Leafs and Oilers fans. Explanations as to why are endless. Bad coaching, they didn't have heart. Maybe it's a curse. Maybe it's like a Boston Red Sox curse. I don't know. I just know, God, it's frustrating. This hockey analyst says both teams had depth. Both had star power, but were lacking in one key area. If you look, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, you can't really name a Stanley Cup champ that didn't ride a hot goaltender all the way to the finals. So I think that uh, both of the Canadian teams who had the most success this year struggled a little bit on the goaltending end. There have been some close calls. Calgary in 2004, Edmonton in 06, Ottawa the year after that, then Vancouver in 2011, and Montreal just two years ago, all lost in the final. At a postseason newser, the Leafs captain didn't get into specifics. Obviously winning is extremely difficult. Um, you know, we're continuing to, to find our way through that and um, do what's necessary. The Golden Knights have eliminated the Oilers in six games to advance to the Western Conference Final. That may not sit well with impatient fans, but others are already looking at the bright side. Last Canadian team, you know what I mean? Go Oilers. Even though we lost, go Oilers, and, and we're looking forward to it next year. Yes, sir. As players lick their wounds, management regroups, and analysts pour over the stats, the end of hockey season has come to Canada weeks early. The Stanley Cup final to be played south of the border once again. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Toronto. You know what? Let's look up from that. Take a look at this curious bird soaring high above a BC golf course, coming face to face with a drone. I don't know, maybe thinking it was a potential meal. So the marvelous bird eventually peeled off, but not before Devin Olson caught the whole thing on video. The rare mid flight footage is our moment. I was flying my drone, I was kind of coming backwards, and I saw out of the bottom of the screen a hawk or an eagle, I'm not sure which one it was, kind of pop up on the screen. He just 
kept coming closer and closer and was definitely interested. Um, and at one point when I tried to land, you can actually see his talons come out and I think he was ready to pick up the drone, but I kept flying backwards, keeping my distance. And um, towards the end, he gets close enough. I think he sees that it's a drone, it's not food and kind of flies off. Getting shots like that, are, I understand it's a kind of rare thing for sure. I fly a lot and I've never had that happen to me before. I'm a licensed drone operator, so everything that I was doing in my flight was legal. And even still, just with animals, no matter what licensing you have, don't try to interact. If you see an animal, like land, don't don't get any closer, even if the shot would be cool. So super rare that there was the bird there and he was curious enough to like keep flying and that I was recording because I could very easily have just been flying backwards and not been recording and missed a lot of that. So really fortunate. That's amazing. What do you think it is? A juvenile bald eagle is, is one theory. He's very sensitive about this. He says, yes, you heard him say it there, uh, licensed drone operator is a legal flight, and he tried to back away. The bird was having none of it, just curious. That is a national for May the 15th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.